Thank you, Brennan. Team. <clears throat> Happy Father's Day to fathers who are out here this morning. I, uh, as I was studying for this week and getting prepared for this week, I literally, <laughs> I don't feel worthy of bringing you a message on how to be a father. Because if you look at my life and my family, you would say, wow, you're really going to take the stage and do this? Yeah, I've studied Scripture, and I know what, it, what Scripture tells us how to be a godly father. And so there are these areas in my life that I have not attained to quite yet. But I would challenge anyone in here, and if I asked the oldest person in here that is a father, you would probably agree you haven't either. So you're going to say, well, you know what? I remember as a kid growing up, if I went to church on Father's Day, I always thought, well, it's not for me. I'm not a father yet. Uh, it's sort of irrelevant that I would even go on Father's Day. But this morning, the four principles that I want to share with you on how to be a godly father, I think will be applicable by everyone in here, whether you're a father, whether you're a mother, whether you're a daughter, son, it doesn't matter. If we live by these in our lives, things would just get better as a family. Now, I also thought, well, what gives me the right? My oldest is 21, and that kind of qualifies me. I'm kidding. It makes me an expert. I don't think so. He would, uh, he's sitting back there, and he actually has access to a microphone, so I better behave. So I thought, well, I mean, it's a sobering subject. And so I, last night we were sitting around as a family, and I was like, hey, what about this dad joke? And what about this dad joke? Just to break the ice, and they all voted them all down. So there won't be any of that. They were like, dad, please don't do that one. I'm like, okay, so, so I won't. But it is sobering to think about the fact that we as fathers have a responsibility to raise a generation who is God-fearing, who loves the Lord, and who will go out and have what, they, what Scripture would tell us, fruits of righteousness. It literally hinges back on us as dads. And I don't know, there's no other nicer way to put it really, but we have a huge responsibility to do as fathers. And I, I want to be not just a successful dad. How many want to be successful dads? Let's just be honest. I don't want to just be a successful dad. I also want to be a godly dad. I want to be the type of dad, and I trust that everyone's sitting in here this morning, and you're already taking inventory in your lives, and you're saying, boy, I know I made a mistake here, here, and here. That's not what this is about. This is about going forward from here. It's never too late to start, so let's all just vow to each other as fathers in this room today that we're going to start from today and, and do things better, but I want to be a godly dad to the point that when, when people ask my children, how did you learn about Christ? How did you receive Christ? They can say, you know what? My dad knelt down at my bed when I was five years old. That was the first time that I received Christ as my Savior. I want that. I also want to be the type of godly father that when they get older and say, wow, how did you learn to treat a woman? I will not throw her under the bus today, I promise. How did you learn to treat a woman that they, in seriousness, could say, you know what, my dad did that. I learned it from my dad. I don't want to just be a successful father. I want to be a godly father. And if, if that's you this morning, then listen up. Because there are some keys that Scripture would show us that would give us a formula of how to be a godly father. And I hope that's your desire this morning. The four basic principles, and I know it's Father's Day, and I know you have big plans, so we're not going to go over time, I promise you. These principles can be applied to every stage of life for everyone who's sitting here this morning. The very first one, you can write this down. God, godly dads devote, they devote their families to the Lord. 
In Joshua chapter 24, verses 14 through 15. In verses 1 through 13, what he's saying, is just to put the context of why he wrote what he's writing now. In 1 through 13, he goes back and he looks over all of the things that God actually did for Israel. He delivered them from Egypt, from their bondage. He provided for them in in the wilderness when they needed things. And so that's why it says, now therefore... Therefore, somebody say, therefore. This is why it's there. It's because of the recognition of what God had done in their previous wandering over the wilderness. And Joshua is writing it down. He says, now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve. In other words, what Joshua is saying there is there were things back in Egypt. There were other gods and other idols and things that were creeping in. And that was, they were in their comfort zone there. But now he's asking them to put it away. But what I see here is he's already setting the preface of the same way that he did in the New, that God does it in, through scripture in the New Testament is God hates a lukewarm person. He's saying, and don't put one foot into what was back there in Egypt or across the river, so to speak, and one foot, you can't have one foot in the, the church and one foot out. And this is talking to the fathers this morning. This is what Joshua was saying that God was telling him. In other words, you have to choose this day who you're going to serve. It doesn't work to ride the fence. It's either going to be you're all in here or you're all out there. It doesn't matter, but Either way, make a choice. Choose this day who you will serve, whether it's the God your father served in the region beyond the river or the God of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. Dads, I'm telling you, we live in a culture today, the land that we dwell, the culture that we're living in today. What is it? Are are we sold out to success? Are we sold out to stuff? Are we sold out to, to whatever it is, what's popular I mean, the land that we dwell, do you know what this month is in June? It's Pride Month. Do we sell out to that? There's things in our world that we don't agree with that we should never be a part of, but yet we're in this culture. We're living in this community. We're living in this world. But hey, it's the land that we dwell. It was the same way for them back then. You got to choose who you're going to follow. And Joshua then says very, in the very last there in 15, he says, but. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Read that with me. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It's interesting to me that Joshua puts himself first. He says, as for me. This hits home to me because I believe very much that I'm responsible for my house. My kids really aren't obligated to be more spiritual than I am. I'm the father of the house and I should be leading by example. Do you not agree? All the ladies said, yeah. Not one man agree with me. It starts with me. It starts with myself. And Joshua did that. He said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I heard it once said, I was at a uh, meeting I used to go to Atlanta to Catalyst. And one of the speakers said this, and I wrote it down. He says, the most important thing that a pastor can give his congregation is not his dynamic preaching or his wise counsel or his strategic leadership. It's his personal holiness, which comes from his devotion to the Lord. And if it's that important for a pastor, then I will tell you it's just as important for you dads and for me as a dad. It starts there. It starts there. I'm going to read it again. The most important thing a dad can do for his family is not his working ethics. It's not how much money he can make. Or the way that he leads the home. It's his personal holiness that comes from his personal devotion to God. That's 
the most important thing that a dad can offer to his family. It's not money. It's not stuff. It's not vacations. It's not sports lessons. It's not dance classes. It's, it's the devotion that we have with the Lord. That's where the holiness comes from. So godly dads devote themselves to the Lord and their families. Becky and I had the opportunity to be in uh, Israel and Jordan, and we went on a, a leadership tour over there, and it was, it was uh, some parts of it were great, some of it w- wasn't so great, but every single morning, we would get together in a group <coughs> and have prayer before we go, and we would recite the Shema. Who knows what the Shema is? Anybody in history buffs the Shema, right? And so this was actually done by the Jewish people. It was required of them to do this. They knew it by heart, and they would literally recite this every single day, a couple times a day. They walked inside of the Shema. It's found in Deuteronomy chapter 6, and they actually, if you study history, they would write it. They had this passage written down, and they would literally had a box. It was called the mezuzah, the box that was put on the doorpost of their home, and they had this passage in there in case you didn't have it memorized that you could recite it by heart. And this is what we would say every single morning before we went on our uh, expedition throughout the day. And maybe this is what we need to do as a church. Maybe you put it in a little box on your office or you post it on your screen. Maybe it's your computer screensaver. I don't care how you do it, but here it is. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 through 9, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. I'm just going to ask, or do we every single day, and do we capture the moments throughout the day to teach our children diligently about God? And shall talk of them when you sit in your house, somebody say sit, and when you walk by the way, somebody say walk, and when you lie down, somebody say lie down, and when you rise, there you go. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and gates. There he is, commanding them what they should do with this passage of all of the things, the the word of God, so to speak. So how do we teach our kids about God? Dads, how do we do it? It's our responsibility, we've established that, that we're the head of the household, and we're supposed to take initiative and responsibility to do this. It's very simple. It's we talk about him. And there were times in my life, and Damon could attest to this, that there were seasons in our lives early on when he was a kid, and I, I regret a lot of the things that happened when he was a child, and, and, and I wish I could do it over. And I know that he's forgiven me. Give me a thumbs up. Yeah, yeah he forgave me. But how do we teach about God? We talk about him. We talk about him every single day when we're sitting. <laughs> when we're sitting around as a family, do, what do we talk about? Do we, do we even have the courage to insert a thing about God in our family conversation? When we're walking around, when we're lying down and when we're rising up, that's all the time. That's all the time. Do we capture those moments and are we intentional on teaching our kids diligently? The way that I teach my kids, children, sorry, is I simply open my mouth and I talk about God. I let God use me in regular conversations. Man, this food is so good. Thank you, Lord. We need to thank God that we have this food. Be intentional about it. Be intentional about the storm came through Monday night. How many were outside Tuesday night? How many saw the sky? Who did that? It's a teaching moment. 
It was beautiful. The sky was absolutely gorgeous on Tuesday night. It's gorgeous every day, but it was exceptionally beautiful on Tuesday night. We talk about God. That's how we teach our children. God did that. Maybe, maybe your kids are older. Are you teaching them godly principles in business? Are you being intentional with that? Maybe they're married. Maybe Are you teaching them still how to treat their spouse? Are you teaching your daughter how she should be treated, not taking sides after they're married? Just saying. We as dads have a huge responsibility to do this for our, te- for our children. Teach them all the time. Godly dads devote their families to the Lord. The second thing that a godly dad does. Oh, this one I don't like. But godly dads disciplines those who they love. It's very simple this morning. I promise you, it's basic stuff. It's just a reminder for me. I'm not saying to go out and beat them, harass them, or make them angry in that way. And, and I'm, not, I'm, I'm talking about lovingly discipline your children. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6 through 11, the writer says this, For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? I've got a question for you. How many of you had a father who disciplined you lovingly? How many of the same ones of you are thankful for that? Huh. My father was a good father. He is a good father. He's still with us. He made some mistakes, but I've forgiven him for those. But I am very, very, very thankful for the way that he disciplined me 98% of the time. He probably, me being honest, he probably should have done it more. I was the youngest one and the others had already wore him out. But I'm thankful for the loving discipline that my dad demonstrated to me. We're not doing our kids a favor by, not, by, by just allowing them to be. If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. I wasn't. Yesterday we had an incident that I did not want to address. And it was one of those deals, I know that mom said, you wait till dad gets home. I know that happened. Because when I got home, he was nowhere to be found. I had to call for him. But I was thankful also for the the buffer, the gap of time that I had to process what happened and to process what I was going to do. And of course, freshly reminding myself this whole week of, Godly, loving discipline. It says that without discipline, you're as an illegitimate child and not a son. That's strong. That's strong. We're not doing them any favors by not disciplining them. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of the spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them. Underline that. We'll come back to that. But he disciplines us for our good that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later it yields 
peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. What is the goal of discipline? I mean, I was actually glad that I wasn't caught in the moment yesterday. I'm glad that I had a buffer because I would have just wanted to go, I'm going to teach you something, right? That's nature. Don't blame, no, don't point your finger and say, oh, Jimmy, we've all been there, right? You just want to, mm, boy, ready and shitler. But what is the goal of discipline? It's not to instantly, I'm going to teach you something. You need to listen to me. You're going to learn now, right? That's, that's human nature. That's kind of how we, what, if we don't watch ourselves, we can default to that. And I have done that in the past, and those are the things that I regret. But the goal of discipline, according to Scripture, should be the peaceful fruit of righteousness. In other words, our goal should be that our, our kids can live out the way that God has called them to live. Go back to that, what I said to underline, it says, as it seemed best to them. And I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about when you go into public <laughs> and you go down the aisle and you hear these vile, this vile language. And I, I don't hear it around here, but since uh, I've been going to Canton to get groceries for my brother about every week or every other week, I have been amazed at some of the language that I hear spoken to the children in Walmart. And I don't, I'm not being profile in Walmart. I'm just saying that's where I end up going. It's amazing. But they don't know God. I'm talking about we do the best as we know how. After we know God. We're going to make mistakes. Don't be too hard on yourself. This is, this is life. It happens fast. It's, it's all in motion, so let's not be hard on ourselves, but I'm not talking about something like that. I'm talking about once you know God and you know Scripture, let's do the best that we can because the other way is absolutely terrifying. Second Timothy, Paul t writes it or, uh, this way. 3, 16 through 17 says, All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Dads, does the way that we discipline, is it lining up with the way that Scripture would teach? Or do we discipline for being obnoxious and annoying? If a two-year-old spills milk and they didn't have a lid on the glass, you should be the one disciplined. That's not what we discipline for. That's, that was an accident. A two-year-old are going to spill milk. They're going to do that. So what do we discipline for? I will tell you, it's the things that don't line up with Scripture. We discipline for reproof. We use scripture for reproof, I should say. What was right, what was wrong. Let me show you why. Let me show you from scripture why you're being disciplined in this way. Because what you did yesterday was not right. It was wrong. Let me show you. For correction, same deal, right and wrong. For training in righteousness, that's why we discipline them. We want to train them to be righteous individuals. Why do we have to discipline our kids? The wisest man who ever lived wrote Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 22 verse 15 says this, that folly or foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline drives it far from him. I read that verse. And my nine-year-old said, okay, I, I got to go. He walked out on that one. Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline drives it far from him. For me to not discipline my kids only enhances and enables them to act foolishly. And that, guys, 
Dads, it's on us. If you love your kids, you'll recognize that there's foolishness bound in their heart. You'll also recognize that there's foolishness bound in your heart. And you will go to Scripture. Maybe you go together and you line it up with what's right and what's wrong. Foolishness will be driven out of their heart and righteousness will happen. So godly dads discipline the ones they love. Third thing that a godly dad does, they demonstrate how to follow Christ. I, uh, every one of my children have went through the stage of, dad, watch me. Dad, watch this. Dad, watch this. Hey, dad, come here. I want to show you something. You got to see this. Any dads recognize that? No? Okay. It's show and tell at our house. The older ones don't do it as much anymore, but there's still, there are times that they want to show you something that they've accomplished or something that they're doing or a project that they're working on or or whatever new uh, flip or whatever they've accomplished. They want to show you. They crave our attention and they won't stop until you stop and actually pay attention to what they're doing i would challenge you though why don't we reverse those roles and why don't you say you want to know how to follow christ watch me you want to know how to be honest in business watch me watch me let me show you how you want to know how to treat a woman watch me do this Godly dads demonstrate how to follow Christ. And Paul teaches this very frequently in his writings. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 15 through 16 says this, For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I, Paul was talking about this, became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. And I urge you then, be imitators of me. you got to know the past of this Paul guy who's writing this. He actually was so bad that he changed his name when he got converted from Saul to Paul. He at one point of his life was out and was persecuting Christians and doing all sorts of hateful things towards Christ's followers. That's the guy that wrote this. And now he has enough confidence in his relationship to God that he can write to churches all across the region. And he writes and says, listen, what I want you to do is you don't have any father figures in Christ, but I want you to imitate me. That's how confident he was in what he was doing for Jesus. And dads, I'm just asking you, and I look at myself, I'm taking inventory in my own life. Am I that confident in my relationship with God that I can write and say what Paul said to the church there? Hey guys, listen, be imitators of me. Kids, watch me. Watch me do all of these business transactions and watch me love on my wife and watch me lead. Do as I do. Be imitators of Christ. That's a huge, huge challenge, isn't it? It is for me. Watch me pray. How do I pray, Dad? Watch me. I'll show you. What does it mean to trust God in faith? Watch me. I'll show you. (laughs) Living by faith gets kind of old, doesn't it? Wears me out sometimes. But I want to be confident in the fact that I can do it and I want my kids to watch how to be faithful, how to trust God. Dad, how do I be generous? Watch me. Are we that confident in our relationship with God that we would write that and say, be imitators of me? Are you living a watch me type of life? He said, Paul says it again in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. He says this, he says, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Dads, let's put this on our computer screen saver. Children, watch me as I follow Christ and imitate me. This is the watchable dad. I'm telling you, they watch you whether you like it or not. I, um, I asked my youngest uh, a while back, 
I actually asked Chloe too, like what, what we were just sitting there. I said, what do you want to be when you get older? And, and I asked the youngest one, I think I said this before, but uh, what do you want to be when you get older? You know, thinking fireman or baseball player or something fun. You know what he said? Dad, I want to be a preacher like you. He's watching. And I don't care whether you like it or not, they're watching you. In some form or some way, they're imitating you. Yesterday was probably a demonstration of imitation too. Told you guys, you want humility? Have kids. Godly dads will demonstrate following Christ. Fourth thing, and the last thing I'll talk about this morning. Fourth thing that godly dads do. Godly dads delight in their children. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1 says this. See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. And so we are. Did you know that God the Father loves you deeply? Do you know that? Scripture talks about it over and over and over. Jesus himself mentioned over 120 times that, about God the Father. And in Scripture, it's over 200 times it speaks about God the Father. And it speaks about the attributes and the things that God the Father has done for us. Do you know that God the Father wants to bless you? Do we actually grasp that? Do we know that God the Father wants to forgive us and that he wants a relationship with us and he wants to spend time with us? That's a godly father. What, what, what if God the Father would hate to spend time with us? How, how would we react to that? What if God the Father wouldn't forgive us? What if God the Father would never want to talk to us? Would we be attracted to him? Would we be pushed away? Would we push it away? We have a huge responsibility. I want to read the rest of that. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. And the reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. You can change the words in there if you want and put your kid's name in there. The reason your kids don't know him, I'm just asking. The reason my kids don't know him, we have a huge responsibility. We have a huge responsibility. What if God wouldn't give us any grace and mercy? What if he didn't want to spend time with us? What would it do for our relationship? Dads, do your kids know that you love them? Brennan, will you bring the team up? Do your kids know that you love them? Do you tell them that you love them? Do, do your kids know that you pray for them? Do they know that you forgive them? Do you talk about it? Do, you know, do they know that you delight in them? And if they don't, that's where the whole aspect of relationship, we're missing it from a child to a parent standpoint. When they know that we delight in them, they'll imitate us. Godly dads delight in their children. Would you guys stand? Just, you know what? We, before we do that, before we do that, just the dads. 
If you're a father in the house today, please stand. Just the dads. Four things that a godly dad will do. They will devote their family to the Lord. They will discipline the ones that they love. They will demonstrate following Christ and they will delight in your children, in their children. And when we start doing these things, we're going in the right direction. I will tell you, I have further to go to perfect that. And I don't think I'll ever get it completely right, but it's my desire to be a godly dad. If that's your desire this morning, I'm just going to ask you to bow your heads and we're going to pray for you. Maybe you're saying, you know what, I failed and, and, and I've not done it right. And I know that it, I've failed miserably in many of those areas. I'm going to tell you, it's never too late to start being a godly dad. Let's bow our heads. Let's pray for the fathers here this morning. Father God, I thank you for your demonstration of fatherhood. I thank you for scripture that you would teach us how to be a godly father. Lord, help us to imitate you and help us to be so close to you that we're confident enough that we would ask our kids to imitate us as we reflect from you. Forgive us, Lord, where we fail as fathers here in this congregation this morning. I ask that you would forgive us where we fail. Help us, give us strength, give us wisdom, give us knowledge of how to use that wisdom in being a better godly father to our families. God, we know that this generation that we're raising up is, they're going to face things that we've never faced before. Help us to stay strong. Help us to have courage to, to build up and to, to teach and to diligently teach. Every moment that we get, help us to be intentional in teaching who you are. God, I pray a blessing over these fathers. And I pray a blessing over the families that are represented here this morning. I pray that you would help us to be more like you. I thank you for this opportunity to worship you this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, and everyone said, amen. If everyone would stand. Happy Father's Day. And dads, let's pray for each other. You pray for me. I'll pray for you. This thing is not easy. It's just not. It gets complicated. It gets, it gets watered down. It, gets, it, it comes at us fast, doesn't it? Let's help each other. Let's be accountable to each other. Let's be transparent with each other. We have a huge responsibility for this generation coming. God bless you guys. Happy Father's Day.